So it's not just as simple as saying, oh, it's the right side of the brain and the left side of the brain, and let's just haphazardly, randomly stimulate one side of the brain. You actually can make things worse if you do that. What I need to do is I need to go and look, and I can say, okay, there's five of you right over there, and you guys are playing you know, off tempo. So I'm going to come over, I'm going to give you some instruction or help or whatever I need to do to get you to play together. And if I get two of them out of five to play better, it makes it less noticeable and it improves it, but it doesn't fix the problem. If I leave one of them out of tempo, that can still throw the other instruments back out again. So I need to identify each and every area and I need to be able to specifically do what I need to, to get that to play faster so it can play together with all of the other areas of the brain. So what's the difference between ADHD and autism and dyslexia? ADHD may be where on the right side of the room there are 10 instruments playing too slowly. But in every child with ADHD it may be a different combination of 10 instruments. So that each child is actually different from the other even though the problem is exactly the same. In autism it may be 30 instruments on the right side of the room that are playing too slowly. But again each child with autism it may be a different combination of 30 instruments. So each child is different. Each disorder is different from the other, even though the underlying problem is the same in all of them. In dyslexia, it would be, let's say, 10 instruments on the left side of the room that are playing too slowly. So you understand? So what we need to do, and this is what we've perfected at Brain Balance, is we need to identify each and every area of the brain that isn't playing fast enough, that is too underdeveloped or immature. And it's usually going to be more on one side versus the other because this imbalance is the problem. And it's usually a maturity issue. So what we need to do is identify each and every one, but in each child it's a different combination. And we need to, and it's a different fix. But the underlying problem in all of these disorders is primarily the same. So you can understand how that complex that can be. What we see is that actually, like I said, not only do we see this unevenness of skills where some skills are better than the other, but in autism it's been documented that they have skills that are better than everybody. That it's not just better than other skills that they have, but that in general many of their skills are better than most humans. So now if you look at a, a toxic model, right, because that's what we hear a lot about that these problems are being caused by you know, mercury poisoning or toxicity or inflammation, something that starts in the body that comes up to produce this in children. There's a lot of effort and a lot of time spent on looking at that. But one of the things that no one's been able to explain to me, and I haven't been able to explain it to myself, is if you have a toxin in the body, right? If you had some sort of neurotoxin that you were exposed to, um, we could all understand how that might cause a stunting of growth and development, right? Or lower the skills of, that was a pretty good catch, right? Um, lower the skills of, of, of the child in general, right? And maybe have a global developmental delay because it's going to go through the bloodstream and it's going to go everywhere in the body and in the brain, right? If it goes into the blood, it's going to go everywhere equally for the most part. So we can understand how that would happen. But if we had a toxin that came into a child, um, how is it a toxin going to make an area of the brain actually function above normal at superhuman levels, while in the same brain it makes other areas function well below normal and without causing any obvious damage to the brain itself? It doesn't really make sense, right? So what we see is that it's probably the other way around. That this imbalance in the brain produces problems and imbalances in our immune system, in our digestive system, in our endocrine system, in our autonomic system, in our um, uh, toxification system. And those imbalances that we see and we measure in these children are really a result of the problem. They're not a cause of the problem. They certainly contribute to the, to the symptoms and can make it worse and can cause even more of a delay. But they're not the cause per se. We need to address them, but just addressing them isn't the answer. And that's why many people spend thousands and thousands of dollars 
uh, on treatments that help reduce symptoms, but they don't fix the problem. This is another study, again, looking at the idea that there's this uh, decrease in functional connectivity in autism where um, there was a reduced, in, again, that corpus callosum, the interhemispheric connectivity were significantly reduced in autism. Um, this is another study looking at the idea of neural synchrony, of synchronization in the brain, uh, and how that relates to uh, certain disorders like autism, Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, and other types of disorders like that. This is another study that was done uh, on young children. Young children, it's not easy to get them to study, to, to study. This was a study that was done on toddlers, children under two years of age. And it was done with the collaboration of three of the top labs in the world, the Weizmann Institute from Israel, um, Carnegie Mellon, and uh, University of California, San Diego. And they got together and they looked at children, young children, and again, what they found that the most significant thing that they could see was disrupted synchronization. And what they also saw was that uh, basically that there was weaker hemisphere, interhemispheric synchronization or weak functional connectivity across the two hemispheres. And that the actual um, verbal ability was negatively correlated with this degree of coordination or under connectivity, which means that the children that had the best language development had the best coordination and more connectivity in the brain, where the other ch children who didn't have good uh, language skills usually had an under, had the least connectivity and synchronization in the brain and that this, this disrupted cortical synchronization was the main defining feature between children that were autistic and children that weren't. Otherwise, their brains looked the same, but the main difference was that the less connectivity, but mainly it was the lack of synchronization in autistic brains. And this is one of the best studies that was done to date. Um, this study also looked at a similar thing uh, but what they found, again, was looking at the electrical coordination in the brain, they found that not only was there abnormal interhemispheric asymmetry, but they found that the right hemisphere was hyporeactive and that the left hemisphere was hyperconnected or hyperactive. So that actually the left brain looks like there's more connections in it and it's more reactive and the right hemisphere was was underactive. And we found that and actually published the same type of research as that as well. So again, what we see is um, to understand really what's happening in the combination of symptoms, uh, what I like to do is give you a, a real quick run through of what the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere do. And this kind of gives you a more clear picture of what's going on. So the left hemisphere is all about details. It basically sees the world as in little pieces and it breaks up those little pieces and lines them all up linearly, logically, uh, sequentially, one at a time. And it analyzes them very carefully and really focuses on every little detail and is looking to figure out a pattern. It's looking to figure out a pattern and recognize that pattern so it can predict what's going to come next. The right hemisphere is the exact opposite. The right hemisphere is what we call global or holistic processing, where it looks at everything all at once, in parallel, at the same time. And it's not looking for any details. And it's not looking at anything logically or linearly. It's just looking at it all at once. And where the left brain looks at things logically, the right brain looks at things intuitively. We're just getting an overall feeling, an overall gist of what's happening without overanalyzing it. The left side of the brain controls small muscles that move rapidly in a sequence like when we're typing, fine motor skills. Um.